morning, church family. Thank you for joining us here at Visalia Adventist Church. We're looking forward to worshiping our Lord this morning. I'm welcoming you. I don't know what kind of a week you've had, but we're so glad that you've joined us. I want to thank you to all of our partners in ministry that have been faithful in their giving. And if you want to give to contribute to help us support the ministry expenses we incur each week, the information is listed below. Church family, we are living in unusual times. Let's worship the God who is the sheltering God, that sheltering God, our creator. Take all 
Happy Sabbath, church family. It's good to be with each one of you uh, this morning, and I'd like to invite you to join me in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for your love and your care for each one of us on this Sabbath day. We come to you, Lord, with many different um, difficulties, worries, anxieties, uh, we're tired, Lord. We're exhausted of this pandemic. We ask for your strength, that you give us the strength, Lord, uh, that we need physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, Lord, to continue pushing forward. We know that you have a plan for us, and we ask that your will be done in our lives, Lord. We ask for the children of our church as they have begun their school year. We ask that you will bless each one of them. Father God, we ask that you bless Pastor Gary as he imparts your word. May we be ready to listen to what you have to say to us this morning. Father God, we do not want to leave this worship time without filling our cups with your love, with your compassion, with your grace, your mercy, and Father God, your righteousness, for we need you. We need you daily, Father God. And so we ask that you continue to bless us as we worship together. We ask that you will bless us, Lord, as we face this pandemic. And we ask, Father God, with all of our hearts, that you continue to surround your arms around many people, Lord, that have lost their loved ones, be in their grief and their sadness. And Father God, we ask that you will give us your Holy Spirit on this very day. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Lord, the door cracks open to a new day and a new time. Fresh air and blue skies, faces we belong to see. You make all things new. It is not the same world we left, and it may never be again. But you are the God of restoration. You, O oh God, make a way in the wilderness, a river in the desert. Where we have turned away, Lord, we come back and pray for healing, for our land, for our people. We pray that you refresh our faith, our relationships, our communities, our purpose. We gather our courage, our hands will be strong, our voices will be loud, and we will carry the good news of your beautiful hope. As we step out, you are with us. Our work has just begun. Good morning, church family. September 2020, can you believe it? We're already in the fall of the year. Six weary months into this pandemic. Most of us are certainly longing for it to be over. It's affecting people all around the world. And in fact, According to the Gallup organization, only 42% of employees believe that the organization they're working for really truly cares about their overall well-being, and that's down 9 percentage points from 51% prior to the pandemic. The prolonged nature of risk has affected the mental health of workers at every level in every organization. We're all feeling it. The health risks, the job security, the lower income, Many do not have the will or the energy to do the things that we did before. And the church is feeling the pressure as well. Employers in the business place have to change how they're operating, their business model. And the church, we're having to adapt, and we feel uh, the pressure of striving for excellence and meeting the spiritual needs of our church family in these very unusual times. And quite frankly, we all are just longing for the second coming of Jesus. 
Over the last six months, there's been an increased conversation about end times and what does all of this mean? Now, looking forward to the month of October, I'll just let you know that we're going to actually do a four-part sermon series on end time thinking, which will be a survey of Old Testament and New Testament literature of the, of the Word of God and see what the different generations throughout the history of the Bible believed and how they thought about the end time. So that's our October sermon series that you won't want to miss. But what is God up to now? What, what will happen in the future? I, I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet. Don't even have the name of a prophet. But I can tell you what God has done during and after times of sheltering in the past. And just want to review a few examples from the history of God dealing with his people. Firstly, God sheltered Noah and his family for one year in the ark. And after that one year, Noah emerged to be the father of all the nations of the world. God sheltered Jacob in the home of his uncle Laban to escape the wrath of his brother Esau. And 20 years later, he emerged with a new family, new wealth, new identity, became Israel, the name of God's chosen people. God sheltered Joseph from age 17 through age 30 in slavery and in prison, and that became the school where God prepared him for greatness. God sheltered Moses in the desert for 40 years, and then he came forth to liberate the Jewish people from Egypt. God sheltered Naomi in the barren land of Moab until she nearly became bitter, and she and her daughter-in-law Ruth then traveled to Bethlehem to participate in one of the greatest love stories of history. God sheltered David 15 years after he had been anointed king of Israel. And, and when David finally did assume the throne, he had become a man after God's own heart and wrote many of the Psalms that we read today. God sheltered Elijah by the brook. And after the sheltering, he stood alone against the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. God sheltered Jonah three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. And when the sheltering was over, Jonah went to Nineveh and preached one of history's greatest revivals. God sheltered Daniel for 70 years in Babylon. He wrote the Old Testament book outlining the future of God's dealings with his people to the very end. God sheltered Esther in the palace of Persia's king and saved her people from destruction. God sheltered the disciples in the upper room for 10 days. And then the Holy Spirit descended in dramatic fashion to form the New Testament church. God sheltered Paul in the Arabian desert for three years, and he emerged from that solitude to turn the world upside down. God sheltered Paul in the Roman prison. By the time he was freed, he had written several of the New Testament epistles. God sheltered the Apostle John in the Isle of Patmos, where God gave him the book of Revelation, the greatest prophetic document of all time. And lastly, most incredibly, God sheltered Jesus in the tomb for three days. And on the third day, Jesus came forth, bringing salvation to the world, to you and to me. So while you and I may not know the exact details of what God is up to right now or what God may do in the future. We do know what God has done and God has throughout time and history sheltered and delivered his people. And we can trust that he is faithful to do it again, that we can trust him to get us through. You can count on the sheltering God to help you no matter where you've been no matter where you're headed. God desires you to move through your times of trouble with supernatural grace and unexplained hope. And in these times of stress and soul fatigue, how exactly can we do that? How do we, how do we go through our times of trouble with supernatural grace and unexplained hope? Well, this morning I want to go to Psalm 121. And for anyone who may feel frightened or abandoned or uncertain about the future, we can find hope and encouragement by the psalmist's word. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I look up to the mountains. 
Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Lane McKeel, a senior adult living in Georgetown, Tennessee, ventured out into the pandemic for some supplies and groceries. He had been shut in for several weeks, and when his disability check arrived, he needed to go out to buy food and other staples. When he reached the checkout counter, he discovered he was $33 short of the $173 total. Have you ever been short? Yeah, I have, and it's kind of embarrassing. Well, the 17-year-old cashier at the checkout stand, by the, she had an iconic name, Elizabeth Taylor. But she turned to her purse, and she pays McKeel's total bill from her own money. And when asked why she did it, she said it was all essential stuff. He needed all of it. And I try to give back when I can. I hope over these last six months you've had a chance and an opportunity to serve others and help others. I know I have. You see, we all need grace, grace that is more than sufficient. Many of the Psalms that we find in Scripture are written for pilgrims needing help and encouragement along the path of life. And here in Psalm 121, we can hear the psalmist crying out, Lord, I need supplies for my journey. God, I need guidance if I lose my way. God, show me the right way. Lord, can you meet my needs? In this psalm of eight verses, we are encouraged to trust God even when life gives us what we haven't asked for. And the confidence expressed in Psalm 121 is rooted in the grandeur of the psalmist's vision of God, the maker of heaven and earth. And so he lifts up his eyes. He sees in the, in the sky the one who was, who is, and is to come. And not only the one who is our destination, but one who is strength for every step of the journey. God is never too great to care for you. And you are never too small for his caring. The psalmist reflects on God soothing our anxiety and watching over us as a shepherd does his sheep. Now, underneath the title of this psalm, you may find a superscription that may say, depending on the version of the Bible that you have, a song of ascents, or in some of the more modern translations, a song of ascent to Jerusalem. Now, there are 15 of these special songs of ascent uh, in Scripture, the first of which is found in Psalm 120. And uh, in the ancient days, the Israelites traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the different feast days in the temple there. And it would be a long journey on foot with family and friends, and they would be enjoying their holiday travel, easy, uh, eager for the good times at the holy city. And thinking about having these feasts, making sacrifices to God. And, and what scholars believe is that the songs of ascent were sung along the road from the lowlands of Palestine up to Jerusalem. And as the travelers walked up the natural incline, they would sing the joyful psalms at each new level. The psalms basically were music for an uphill journey. And for us today, these Songs of pilgrimage become metaphors for our own uphill spiritual journey to the kingdom of God. You see, the Bible and Jesus never promise an easy life. In fact, Jesus' own words were, take up your cross and follow me. In fact, go to Matthew 10 and in verses 38 and 39, notice the words of Jesus. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. So the Bible never claims life is going to be easy. And for some of us in the church, even we're, we're running to save our life and we're hiding to save our life and protect our life. And that's, that's okay to a point. But the church still has a mission. Our work is still alive and well. Christianity is just no free pass or a shortcut on the essential human experience by any means. 
However, many Christians come to the mistaken idea or conclusion when they face trouble. And that, that, that irrational conclusion is that the, the presence of trouble implies the absence of God. A greater mistake could not be made. God's word reminds us that we are pilgrims, we are strangers in a foreign land, the roads are filled with hazards, the road is long, it's steep, it's weary, it's dangerous, but the long winding road of our journey finally comes to the city of God where we will experience joy and feasting. And simply stated, this is the biblical view of life in this world. Pilgrims, strangers in a land, on a hard road to the kingdom where we will have joy and feasting and peace. And so the psalmist, I will lift my eyes to the hills. He's prepared for the journey. He knows he's going to be going up into the mountains to Jerusalem. He thinks about the miles ahead and the twists and the turns and the surprises. The old friends that he will rejoin and reconnect with. The new ones that he will make. He may think about the dust and the heat and the darkness and the thirst. He, he lifts his eyes and admires the graceful line of the mountains embracing the sky. Isaiah 55 and verse 12. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. Psalm 125 verses 1 and 2. Those who trust in the Lord are secure as mountains. They will not be defeated, but they will endure forever. So while God doesn't promise a life of ease and comfort, history demonstrates that he delivers his people. He's walking with his people through the times of trouble and through the times of, of frustration and hurt and pain. And ultimately the promise is that he will deliver his people. And he will. Now, in ancient times, the mountains represented uh, danger, hardship. There would be wild animals that could attack. There might be bandits or thieves. The other interesting thing is that in the pagan cultures of ancient times, the pagans would build temples to the gods, their gods, in the mountains. And, and so godly pilgrims would, would find in the mountains a sense of majesty of the, for the creator. But he, So you have this mixture of Mountains and danger and hardship and animals and thieves and pagan temples and God, other gods. And, and then this God who is the creator of heaven and earth. So even God's people sensed maybe some fear and a little da danger and reservations of the unknown in the mountains. And for many it be, was a place of fear rather than a place of hope. It was a, it was a place of danger rather than a place of salvation. Psalmist thoughts, he's reflecting on the many meanings of the mountains. He gazes upward at the outset of his journey. I look up to the mountains. Now, in the past, I've fallen victim to a misconception about this psalm. Now, I was raised pretty much during the time of predominant King James Version use. Now, if you also are familiar with the King James Version and its time-honored punctuation, which is actually misleading in this particular instance. So I want to show you and compare the, the King James Version with the New King James Version, and I want you to notice how they read differently. The punctuation actually has been corrected in the New King James. So here's how it reads in the King James Version. I will lift mine eyes unto the hills, comma, from whence cometh my help, question mark. Now in the New King James and other modern translations, it reads this way. I will lift up my eyes to the hills, dash, from whence comes my help, question mark. Now, I used to conclude that I would look to the mountains for help. But that's not at all what the psalmist is saying. The writer is making a statement. I look up to the mountains, and then he breaks off, and he asks a question. 
Does my help come from there? What a difference a dash makes. So this traveler looks to the hills and then looks inward. And as he looks inward, he's asking himself a question. Where am I going to find help? He feels the hesitancy and the concern and the insecurity, as many of us do, on a long journey. He's having an internal monologue. We talk to ourselves. Don't you do it? I do it sometimes as well. And so in Psalm 121, the traveler is feeling some anxiety about getting through the hills and the faraway destination. And will anyone help me? What if I become sick or somebody attacks me or, or I run out of money? So he looks around, he looks then within, and finally he looks above. Verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. So verse 2 is where the psalmist really gets to the very essence of this entire song. He's telling himself, I've looked to the mountains, no help. I've looked within, no guidance. Finally, I've looked up, and I've now realized that my only source of help is God. I can't find help from anyone else other than God. What a lesson for life's travelers on earth. My help comes from the Lord. The essence of that statement, this is the most important step you must take in caring for your soul, is to recognize that my help comes from the Lord. We get ourselves in trouble and we become fatigued and we're going to be talking over the next couple of weeks about different ways that we we substitute God with other things in turning for our hope or trying to cope. Step one and most fundamental to caring for your soul is to recognize that the only place for true help, hope, and healing is from the Lord. Being loved by a creator who hung the stars in space, who set the earth on its course, being loved and cared for by one like that is powerful encouragement. And if God guides the planets, Surely he can guide our little steps. And that's why the phrase was frequently used in blessing uh, their, their, fellow, uh, their fellow Hebrews. They would grant these blessings to one another by saying these words. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and the earth. Psalm 115 verse 15. Psalm 146 verses 5 and 6. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. The creator of everything you can see the creator of everything you can imagine, possesses power that's unquestionable. And when you cast your hope in him, you're not only coming to a God who cares, but you're coming to a God who can. On the day that your journey brings you face to face with disappointment, disaster, pain, and loss. You will be filled with an unaccustomed helplessness. We've all been there. We all will continue to go there from time to time. And as the psalmist, you will cry out to the Lord, Lord, I need help. And in your moment of deep anxiety, remember, The one to whom you are praying is the sheltering God who can, the creator and the sustainer of heaven and earth. Be encouraged with those words today.
how high would I climb mountains if the mountains where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you graze the other side? Oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply cause in the highlands and the heartache you neither more nor less inclined I would search and stop but nothing you're just not that hard to find I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you when the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valley so the same in my way 
you're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valley so the same no less God within the shadows no less faithful when my heart lets me astray so you're the So where are you in your spiritual journey? Chances are you're feeling fatigued and tired from all that's going on around you. Know this, today God is reaching out to you right where you are. He desires to be your sustainer, to be your sheltering God, the one who embraces you so that you can experience amazing grace, hope, and healing. Let me pray a blessing on you as you begin a new week this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your wonderful love. Thank you for being the sheltering God who can, the creator and the sustainer of earth. Lord, walk with us this week. Bless your people. You know their needs. May they be encouraged as the psalmist encourages us to know that we look up and where does our help come from? It comes from the Lord who created all things. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us in return. And we give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray.